Patrol 810. We've got our clout going down on Little River Road. It's a white male, blue jeans, light blue shirt. He's getting into a citation. Driven by a white female. Looks like he got a purse, maybe a camera. Got into a blue Chevrolet. Headed west on Little River Road. 700 415. 517 myself, Art East of Bull Falls, in position to make that stop. 700 stop. that an organized, well-planned surveillance can be vital to the success of any law enforcement effort. Over the years, the information gained through surveillance has resulted in the apprehension, arrest, and conviction of thousands of criminals all over the country. And although each surveillance has a unique strategy and may employ different techniques and procedures, they all revolve around one fundamental principle. To remain unseen, to blend into the environment, to gather information without your subject knowing you're there. Now, in an urban area with its busy thoroughfares, tall buildings, secluded alleyways, and crowded sidewalks, it can be relatively easy to become part of the background. But what if you're out here in the open or in the forest? What do you do to blend into the background out here? And what techniques do you employ to gather the information you need? Those are the fundamentals of rural surveillance, and that's what we're going to be talking about during this program. There are two fundamental principles that are key to the success of rural surveillance operations, thorough planning and preparation for the operation itself, and the proper application and execution of the surveillance strategy. Let's take a closer look at each of these fundamentals. Several factors should be considered and some basic steps should be followed during the planning stage of any rural surveillance. The first step is to identify the objective of the surveillance. Make sure you know what you're trying to accomplish. You might want to obtain evidence of a crime or a probable cause for an arrest or a search warrant. You might want to check on some informants or verify the information they've provided. A surveillance could also be employed to prevent someone from committing an illegal act, or in the case of our car clouders at the beginning of the program, to catch them during the actual commission of the crime. After determining the objective of the surveillance, you should then obtain and develop all the information you can about the subject or subjects of the surveillance. Get their descriptions and find out if any have a criminal record. Learn about their habits, the places they like to spend time. You should also look into the identities of all their known associates and get the descriptions of all the vehicles they use. All these pieces of information will help you later on when you're conducting your surveillance. Finally, try to determine the methods of operation employed by your subjects. What behavior do they illustrate during the commission of the crime? Do they carry any weapons? Is there a common thread to any of the actions they take? This information is crucial to the success of your mission and can be vital to your own survival. Make sure you have this information cold. But preparation for a surveillance goes far beyond learning all you can about your subjects. You should also gain full knowledge of the area where the surveillance is to occur. So make sure you conduct a thorough reconnaissance of the area well before any surveillance takes place. Determine if a vehicle can be used for transportation to and from the surveillance area, or if you will have to travel by foot. Also, during the reconnaissance, you should determine the surveillance strategy best suited for the area. One of the most reliable of these strategies is a stationary surveillance, where you sit and wait in seclusion for the action to come to you. This type of surveillance can be termed a reactionary approach to law enforcement. 
in that you choose a time and place for your surveillance operation based on the intelligence you've gathered regarding the case. If your intelligence is accurate, chances are your surveillance will be a success. During your reconnaissance, after you've located the spot from which your subjects are operating and you can determine that your surveillance will be stationary, your next step is to locate an area to set up your observation post. The primary consideration is to have a safe vantage point to witness the activity in sufficient enough detail. Don't choose an area so remote that you can't see anything, but be mindful to keep a safe enough distance to avoid detection. With these factors in mind, determine the areas that will allow a thorough surveillance during your reconnaissance, and then choose the most fitting of those areas for your observation posts. Look for things such as adequate ground cover and vegetation. Areas that are slightly lower than the normal elevation may also help you hide yourself. Make sure that you locate well below the horizon. You also want to ensure that there's a safe way into and out of the observation post. Determine when the best times are to enter and exit. If the surveillance is to be conducted over a period long enough to make shift work necessary, you want to make sure your comings and goings can be made in relative seclusion. Looks good, Doug. Let's go ahead and set up. It's important to be realistic when determining whether there's a safe way in and out of the area. You don't want to be burned because of your own movements back and forth. Now, it may be possible to switch shifts between the hours of darkness, but you should plan for an extended stay by a single team of surveillance. During your reconnaissance, you should determine the kinds of equipment that will be appropriate for the mission. Along with communication and information gathering considerations, you should also determine the clothing and types of camouflage that will be required. If the stay is to be a long one, Properly prepared food and containers of water may also be necessary. For nighttime operations, specialized equipment is almost always a necessity. Night vision glasses can not only help the human eye, but can also be fitted to recording equipment such as video cameras. So if your operation is to be run at night, make sure you carry this type of equipment. The final step in the planning stage of a rural surveillance is to conduct a briefing for all of those who will be involved in the mission. Everything about the surveillance should be covered thoroughly so that all the participants fully understand their responsibilities. Good morning, everyone. Let me direct your attention to the front of the room and the chart showing our primary operations area. The briefing should cover the nature of the surveillance, what the objective is, and all individual assignments. It should also include all known information of the subjects and their known accomplices, as well as a detailed description of the area in which the surveillance is to take place. The placement of the observation post, ingress and egress routes, and all time schedules should also be discussed. As the Fighting Creek Gap on Little River Road. In addition, equipment, supplies, and clothing requirements and limitations should be understood by all participating officers. If there are any questions concerning any part of the mission, they should be answered now, not when you're out in the field. At the conclusion of the briefing, everyone should know everything about the pending operation. Which brings us to the surveillance itself. The most important thing during a surveillance is to be able to blend into the background to become part of the environment, to become invisible, so to speak. And in order to be able to do this, several techniques and procedures should be considered. Let's look at these points one by one. The first factor to consider is clothing and camouflage. Your clothing should fit the weather conditions that will be prevalent during the surveillance and allow you to remain still and comfortable even on an extended surveillance. Make sure you carry warm clothing if necessary and the appropriate rain gear if required. Headgear can also be very useful. It will help keep you warm during cold weather and is also useful as part of your camouflage effort. The idea of camouflage is to help you blend into the terrain around you. There are several different types of camouflage clothing and accessories to help you do this and an equal number of techniques in each of their uses. The practice of wearing camouflage actually began with primitive man. The spears, arrows, and clubs he used to hunt with had a limited range, and he therefore had to be able to move in close to his prey without being detected. 
He was able to accomplish this by tying leaves and sticks onto his body with leather cords. That would help him blend into the environment. The French and Indian War saw early American rangers use a camouflaging technique they had learned from the Indians. By coloring their clothes with natural dyes, they were able to hide much more effectively from the enemy. Now, during World War II, Korea and Vietnam, and up until the present day, camouflaging techniques have become much more sophisticated and specific in their uses. Camouflages have been developed for just about every environment. The idea is to select the type camouflage that is appropriate for the area you will be in. For example, if you will be operating in a conifer hardwood forest, a good choice of camouflage would be the woodland camo pattern. If you are to be working in a wooded area where tall trees and dense green ground foliage are present, you might choose the tree bark green leaf camo pattern. A forest with low leaves and foliage might call for real tree, mossy oak, or ASAT camouflage. There are several other patterns of camouflage that have been developed for just about every kind of terrain. Make sure you choose the pattern that best suits your purpose. The choosing of your camouflage pattern is only the first step in becoming truly invisible, though. The shape and colors of the human body are distinct, and so the use of grass, twigs, leaves, even of camouflage cloth, they can be used to help break up the outline and to add color, contrast, and texture to help blur the image. As you can see by looking at these two officers, although they're both wearing the same type of camouflage clothing, one officer is much more hidden than the other. The appropriate use of grass, twigs, leaves, and strips of camouflage cloth has helped to break up his silhouette. In addition, the application of military face paint, charcoal, or plain old mud can reduce the reflective qualities of the skin on the face, neck, and hand. Gloves and face masks are very effective as well and can also protect you against insect bite. These two officers are wearing the ultimate in camouflage, the ASAT 3D camo suit. If camouflage clothing is not available, try to match your surroundings with the color of your clothing. Avoid single colors. Nature provides a diverse mix of colors, textures, and contrast, and you should do the same. Just as before, you should employ various types of leaves, sticks, and twigs to help break up your image. In all cases, you should avoid wearing any clothing or carry any equipment that reflects sunlight, such as this can, for instance. Remember that the only natural thing in a forested area that reflects light is water. So if you reflect light in any way, you'll be setting yourself apart. As you can see by these two officers, although both are otherwise extremely well camouflaged, the reflection from one officer's watch brings your eye right to him. Other objects that are reflective by nature should also be avoided. Keep away from bright service patches, belt buckles, metal canteens, and mess kits. Fast food wrappers or soda cans should also be avoided, along with reflective food packets. The use of some equipment, however, no matter what problems it causes with your camouflaging effort, is a necessity when it comes to safely gaining the information you need. Items such as food, sunglasses, radios, binoculars, and weaponry are very useful in what they can do for you but you should choose the equipment you need with restraint on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the requirements of the surveillance. Take only what you absolutely need. All the equipment and techniques we've discussed so far here today are designed to help you gather the information you need while keeping you hidden from sight. But in order to effectively blend into the surrounding terrain, you must also remain hidden from other human senses as well. Avoid any odor-producing products, such as deodorant, cologne, and hairspray. Insect repellent should be of the non-scented variety. And don't bring any foods or beverages with you that have a distinctive odor. Coffee, for example, has a very strong aroma and can be detected from long distances. The art of camouflage also includes the ability to remain silent. Try to avoid coughing and sneezing and keep your movements to a minimum. Also, keep in mind that the human voice carries long distances out in the open. When it's possible, try to communicate with hand signals. But if you must talk, 
do so only in whispers. Communication is a major factor in any type of surveillance. Now you've got four subjects headed your way. And if uh, your coverage is over a wide area and other teams are involved, chances are you will be using radios as a means of communicating. There are several points to consider if you intend to use radios during a surveillance. First, make sure the position of your observation post allows for the use of radios. If communications are vital and the radios are not operating in your present position, you may have to change the position of one or more of your officers. Let's go find another location. All right. If possible, use voice-activated communication systems. They keep your hands free for other things. You should also use earphones for all radio communication. This will eliminate the distinctive noise of radio chatter, which, if heard, will burn your surveillance. Always carry a spare radio or extra batteries. Once you're settled in at the observation post, having to have a replacement brought in may be unnecessarily risky. In addition, keep your radio equipment protected from the elements and make frequent radio checks to ensure proper operation. Radio check. If your surveillance is to be conducted over a long period of time, there will be some necessary movement in and out of the observation post. Now, we've already talked about choosing safe routes in and out of the area. We should also touch on some of the techniques that will make your movements even safer. So, I'm going to go scout around the other side. Okay, I'll be careful. When moving in or out of the observation post, or anywhere in the area for that matter, the primary rule to follow is to move slowly. Any erratic movement could catch someone's eye or cause some loud complaints from the resident wildlife. Either way, you've brought attention to yourself. You should stop frequently, not only to give yourself a chance to check your surroundings, but also to reduce the risk of drawing attention to yourself. Keep an eye out for booby traps and be prepared for confrontations with wild animals or dogs. Stay in shaded areas during your movements and take advantage of low areas and depressions. If at all possible, stay within the tree line. Place your feet carefully as you walk, avoiding dead branches or twigs or any soft ground which may leave footprints. It's a yellow lady slipper. My friend saw and if someone should there, appear, take a lesson from the animals in the fine. wild. Escape and conduct your surveillance operation. Seven hundred four one five. Seven hundred copy. We have two individuals in custody. We also have uh, stolen articles out of the vehicle. We'll be en route to the jail. 700 copy. Good job, Sebastian. Copy.